So we come now to priority need, which is probably, well, certainly the most complicated bit of the law that you're going to need to know in these kind of early stages of making an application. Um, and basically, in order for me to try and explain this as clearly as I can, I'm going to split it into two different groups. I'm going to kind of divide it down the middle um, because within priority need, there are situations in which you'd automatically be in priority need. So, for example, pregnancy or having dependent children. And then there's this kind of umbrella term of vulnerability, which uh, that's the complicated bit, essentially. So I'm going to do the automatic characteristics first. I'm going to do another video looking at <clears throat> um, the, the kind of the concept of vulnerability within housing law. So um, first thing to say about it is that the automatic characteristics are no better or worse than the vulnerability kind of umbrella. So, you, you know, you'd be in priority need either way it's just easier to show that often it's easier to show that someone's automatically in priority need because in most cases they're black or white situations so for example you're either pregnant or you're not you know it's not it's not kind of a gray area um so let's look at automatic uh, priority need characteristics now um as i'm kind of doing these videos the domestic abuse act has just kind of got royal assent so that means there's an additional automatic priority need characteristic but I haven't yet seen this kind of work in practice. So kind of, you know, a lot of what I'm about to say about it is kind of based on what I think might happen and what, you know, the arguments that I think we're going to need to present to councils in order to support people to get housed. Um, but let's just do the easy ones first. So first of all, as I've already mentioned, um, there's kind of the, the five black or white characteristics. So um, being, being uh, pregnant, and it doesn't matter how many weeks pregnant you are, as soon as you know you're pregnant, you are in priority need. It's that simple. Um, you know, often we do hear councils kind of saying things like, oh, you know, you know, you're not 16 weeks pregnant yet, or you're not 24 weeks pregnant, so you're not in priority need yet. Um, you've got people with dependent children, which in, in the most part is black and white. Um, you know, uh, it's fairly simple. There is a kind of um, a slightly more complicated bit to it where you've got separated parents who are both um, support, you know, kind of equally supporting the child. So there, you know, in some cases there will be there will be situations where both parents um, would you know could be said to have dependent children. Um, you've got 16, 17 year olds. So all 16, 17 year olds who are homeless will be in priority need. Um, so that bit's black and white. But there's a kind of a, I guess another bit to say about this in that if you are 16 or 17 years old or you're supporting someone who's 16, 17 year old, um, they can get assistance from you know, the local authority both under the Housing Act, which is what we're talking about and under the Children Act. And in one sense, um, if, if, you know, in, in general terms, uh, if a 16, 17 year old approached a, a housing authority, a, you know, housing options, the council would be under a duty to provide temporary accommodation immediately. But all that would need to be potentially is just basically four walls and a roof. There's no kind of need for any support with that. And often, you know, 16, 17 year olds, you know, they're gonna need additional support to kind of manage things and kind of get off the ground. So in that situation, actually, you know, it would be in, you know, in pretty much every situation I can think of, it'd be in the 16, 17 year olds interest to approach children's services because children's services would not only have a duty to accommodate them, make sure they have somewhere safe to live, but they'd also have additional duties to support that child once they're living there. So, you know, we had a case back in, in Bedford Council back in November where a 17 year old, you know, you see it all the time, bounce between housing and children's services and you've got compensation um, but it's you know it's that's that's a fairly typical thing so you know you've got children's services and housing basically both saying the other one's got the duty they both have a duty so that's kind of it's that simple really um, you've then got um, 18 to 20 year old care leavers and again this is they're really kind of complicated bit to this which I'm not going to go into in this video in chapter 8 of the, the homelessness code of guidance there is a breakdown of kind of where someone who is 80, uh, 18 to 20 year olds who's been in care would be in priority need. So this kind of, I think, I, I don't understand the Children Act very well. I think it kind of dovetails with the Children Act, which is why there's this kind of particular kind of situation in which someone would automatically be in priority need. Um, you've then got the fifth one of this kind of this, this kind of easy bit is, um, is where someone is homeless as a result of a fire or a flood. Um, you know, or I guess another kind of act of God, so to speak. So, you know, um, there was a couple a year or two ago, I can't remember now, there was, a, there was a, a town up north where the kind of the reservoir above the town, you know, the dam was kind of, you know, seen to be, uh, you know, at risk of subsidence or whatever. And so the whole town was basically at risk of flooding. So they had to be removed. In that situation, every each and every person in that town would have been in priority need. So the council would have owed a duty to house them. 
um, you know, it temporarily, certainly whilst the, the dam got fixed. Um, but you see kind of sinkholes and all kinds of weird and wacky things. Illegal evictions would not come under this. Um, so, you know, that's in one sense, it, so it needs to be like this kind of, I think the words force majeure or whatever, like an act of God, rather than something where a landlord's just not doing their job properly. So that that's the five of the six, which are the easy bits of automatic character, um, priority need. The sixth one, which is the new one under the Domestic Abuse Act, is that basically where someone um, has been made homeless as a result of domestic abuse, and as we established in the homelessness video, that does not mean they need to have fled yet. You know, if you are in accommodation, which is perfectly decent accommodation, but you are at risk of, or it's probable that domestic abuse will continue whilst you're there, it's not reasonable to continue to occupy the accommodation, so you are already homeless now. I'm again in Bedford a few years ago now, um, you know, I had this argument with a housing officer who just would not, you know, he was saying, well, she hasn't fled yet, so she can't be homeless. And I'm like, no, it doesn't work like that. Um, and in that situation, just as kind of a tangent, what we essentially did was we basically insisted that the, the individual was dealt with with a housing officer of the same gender. So he got a new housing officer. Basically, he was decent and then kind of progressed as it should do. But the situation was so distressing, she ended up returning to the abuser for several months before actually kind of summoning up the courage again to, to reapproach. So, yeah, that's the kind of fairly typical situations you were dealing with. Um, so, you know, as I say, you don't need to have fled to be homeless. So if you are... If you were basically, if it is probable that remaining in your home will result in you being subject to domestic abuse or anyone in your household will be subject to domestic abuse, then you are homeless. And I think within that as well, it's worth saying that it would potentially kind of cover harassment and kind of risk of violence from others outside the household. Um, but this kind of all leads up to a, a potential blind spot of the Domestic Abuse Act. And it's it's not just us saying this, you know, last year, so the summer of 2020, there was a, an impact assessment done by the government, which identified that potentially all that's going to happen by making, you know, making kind of people in priority need automatically in this situation is that housing officers will simply deny that the abuse is happening at all. So up until now, um, you know, someone approached the council, they're experiencing domestic abuse. It would be open to a housing officer to say, look, you know, I'm really sorry you're going through this. You know, here's some support services that we can refer you on to. We'll do a dash form, we'll do, you know, kind of do it as a safeguarding alert form, all the rest of it. You know, but actually, unfortunately, you don't hit the, the kind of the threshold for vulnerability within housing law. Now, that's not true, but at least that's something, at least, you know, at least they're actually validating that the abuse is happening and they're taking further action to refer that person or the household to kind of other support. Um, under the new law, the only option housing officers have got to gatekeep people from the assistance that's owed to them is to simply deny the abuse is happening at all, which I think is actually a real kind of step back. And unless professionals are willing to fight for their clients, you know, and fight for justice for their clients, we are going to see people, you know, in horrendous uh, kind of situations subject to abuse. They summon the courage up to go and approach the local authority and the local authority's first response is, you know, I'm really sorry, we, don't, we just don't believe you, basically. We don't believe the abuse is happening. You know, it's just, just an argument, you know, he hasn't actually hit you yet. All those kind of things I think we're going to start seeing unless professionals really kind of, you know, get to grips with this stuff very quickly. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of, as I say, that's that's the new one. I'm, you know, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I don't think I am. But, um, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, certainly councils could could do a lot of work around ensuring that housing officers are properly trained and that there are proper resources available to actually accommodate all the people who are subject to abuse. Because there are, I don't know what the official stats are, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who are likely to be abused today in the country. So they would potentially be able to approach their local authority and the local authority would have a duty to to kind of accommodate them somewhere safely. So, you know, it's, it's a massive undertaking for councils. And, and whilst the direction of the law is really, really good, um, unless councils have the resources to actually, um, you know, kind of actually house people, it's just going to, it's, all it's going to do is magnify the injustice of it. And so, you know, this is, and ultimately, the bottleneck, I would say, in this situation is housing officers believing the lie that, you know, that housing stock levels are, you know, something out of their control. You know, if you are a housing officer, and you have not got the resources available to discharge the law you know, properly, then you need to, you know, your only legitimate option is to raise that as a, as a formal concern in some way. So there are some, we do a video on that as well, just in terms of how you can do that. But um, yeah, that's, that's ultimately, you know, it's, it's not, it's not enough for council or housing officers to say, well, there's not enough housing. That's just the way it is because that isn't just the way it is. You know, is it a political decision to build enough houses or not? And 
So, um, you know, kind of the last 20 or 30 years of, of governments in the UK have not built enough houses to keep up with demand. Um, so obviously that's kind of part of the, well, a big reason, big part of the reason why we've ended up in this situation. So that's automatic priority needs. Now I'm going to do a video on vulnerability. So, um, you know, again, same as I always say, um, it's not enough just to know the law. You know, in one sense you can read it, but that that is not enough in itself to actually get people housed. You know, it's difficult. It's difficult to argue with housing officers about these kind of standard things. And we do run this Facebook group called Better Homes as Practice, which you know you can kind of join, and it's just a place really just to kind of ask anonymized what if questions and um, just kind of. Uh, I guess kind of look at kind of actually pragmatically how you how you would go about getting the support that your clients are eligible for. So um, yeah, do check that out.